to you by Orbital Assembly Corporation, with your hosts, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt and Eric Ward. Hello, welcome to Our Future in Space. In this podcast, we explore the technical, economic, social, political, and ethical considerations of moving people into space to live, work, and ultimately to play. Our species is at an inflection point in its evolution where we now have the ability to sustain life off planet in low Earth orbit and soon throughout the solar system. Do we merely survive on this planet or expand outwards into the solar system and thrive? Orbital Assembly is leading the way in the development of artificial gravity stations so people can live, work, and thrive in space. OAC's platforms are market category creators. They are backwards compatible with current standards, allowing for you to move from concept to production at the pace of business. To learn more, visit orbitalassembly.com. I am your host, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt. I am the Vice President for Science and Research at Orbital Assembly. And I am joined today, as always, by my co-host, Eric Ward, who is the Vice President for Engineering Design at Orbital Assembly. How's it going? It's going really well. I like that today, Jeff, to, to live, work, and ultimately play. It's uh, I like that very the humanity, too. The, the human experience, right? Um, <laughs> I'm excited about, about our interview today, too. Uh, we have uh, Vincent Pribble as our guest today. He's the co-founder and COO at Micromeat who produce white label solutions to enable anyone to sell cultivated meat both on Earth and in space. Previously, Vincent worked with NASA, Blue Origin, and ULA on the SLS, New Glenn, and Delta IV rockets. He has worked on nearly every stage of launch system development from early system napkin sketches all the way to launching the fastest man-made satellite around the sun. Vincent, welcome to our future in space. Great to be here. Yeah, we are so privileged to have you. And, um, you know, we want to ask you about Micromeat and its mission uh, first, but I want to make sure to ask about your space experience, which certainly seems to be rich and uh, uh, quite exciting. Uh, so uh, please fill us in on that in, in a few minutes. But um, yeah, why don't you tell us about Micromeat, why you founded it and uh, what its mission is? Sure. So Micromeat is... Uh working on providing cultivation solutions for anyone who's interested in selling cultivated meat. Uh, in order for us to see the, the life-changing and, and world-changing improvements of cultivated meat, we have to make it easy enough where anyone who wants to uh, can be a part of the game. Um, I started, uh, started Micromeat with uh, Dr. Ann Sophie, who is our, our founder and CEO. Um, after looking at the global situation surrounding uh, climate change uh, during COVID and really starting to see, I think, an inflection point in the number of wildfires and uh, starting to see the impact of famine across the, the world. And part of that was um, why we both kind of got into saying, you know, how, how can we both participate and, and help change things? Um, you know, uh, one of, one of the hardest parts about, uh, living today is that um, we're at a time where our species has uh, really advanced very far, but a lot of the methods that we're using still come from hundreds of years ago. And at scale, at the scales we're seeing, they're really starting to impact the planet. So doing things and working on sustainable uh, missions and goals to help change that, to help come back from, uh, you know, this brink uh, of, of the global climate crisis to, uh, to see that we can have, you know, hundreds and, and thousands of more generations is, is, uh, the important part. Yeah, I know. I completely understand. And yeah, it's, it's, sorry, Eric, you want to jump in with a question? Oh, I, I would Please. say that's an excellent mission. I, I think that's a really interesting point. And, and this came up in a previous conversation that, uh, that Jeff and I had about how, uh, you know, what we're, the world that we're living in, right, even though it's it's 2022, uh, is still very much founded on these first industrial revolution ways of doing business, of, you know, working together, of, you know, these kind of technological foundations that, like, okay, we've got computer processors, but, but that's a good point. Like, we still get our meat from the same type of farming that we did, you know, 100 plus years ago. So 
I think that's a really, yeah, really exciting vision to to try to you know find ways we can modernize this in, in a healthy way. So uh, I did I did want to ask you know uh, you mentioned cultivated meat right, and um, it'd be nice to get a little more detail like what exactly does that mean cultivated meat and you know how how is this going to become so important? Sure. So cultivated meat is essentially real meat. It's just grown without using animals. So the process is, is fairly, is a simple process with many complex steps in between. But essentially how this works is you find an animal or a species that you're looking at cultivating. You find an animal, you provide it a bit of anesthetic, and you perform a biopsy to take a small sample of cells. And that's pretty much it. That's the animal's part. And that small sample will eventually go out to make thousands and thousands of, of kilograms of meat. Um, once that biopsy is taken, we perform some steps on it to proliferate the stem cells that are inside of the animal's muscle tissues. Those stem cells eventually hit, you know, a uh, kilogram, a uh, thousand kilograms, whatever your goal is. And then we, uh, we basically tell those cells, okay, now it's time to change. It's time to become, um, real muscle tissue or real collagen or, or gristle or whatever that component is fat. And then we, we shape it and we provide that structure to have an, a real, uh, cut of meat. Uh, it's molecularly identical in every way. The only reason that it's not identical is because the animal does not die. Well, and that's obviously a really big distinction if you're uh, doing this partly for animal welfare purposes, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, what, go ahead. What about Eric. the resource input, right? Like, the, you know, I can imagine some other reasons you might um, you might do this. Animal welfare, animal welfare of course, important. But, um, you know, my understanding is that we spend a lot of resources, energy, land, you know, et cetera, in growing crops to feed our, you know, our animal, you know, produce, right? That it, it's something, you know, some percentage, I think in the U.S., greater um, uh, vegetable crops go to feeding animals to then eat than the actual humans just consume straight away. And so when you're looking at this cultivated meat, um, what about the, like the input resource to that, the, the energy, the food, you know, that this, this meat needs to grow, uh, versus, uh, using live animals to, to produce the, the meat. Sure. So there's a, a host of benefits from this. You know, when you look at an overall perspective, you know, uh, the typical traditional meat industry uh, produces about 15% of the global greenhouse gas emissions and cultivating meat has the potential to reduce that by about 91%. Um, but in every single part of that, we start to see advantages. So the feed, the cereal grains, you know, we're looking right now at um, global production of cereal grains, wheat, oats, barley, those are all starting to come down. Um, feed for cattle, feed for chickens, feed for pigs, all of those are related to your traditional cereal grains. So that all can go away and actually move to human consumption um, by using cultivated meat. Um, cultivated meat, our inputs are amino acids and sugars and uh, growth factors. And those things, while uh, difficult in their own right to make, are um, are far uh, less on the scale for emissions than, you know, mm -hmm. growing oats and stuff like that. Um, in and addition, animals, though, go ahead. And then the animals that have then consume that and all of their inefficiencies, right? Yes. Um, you know, so for growing the cattle, uh, you know, when you think about Amazon deforestation, 91% of uh, deforestation that's happening in the Amazon is happening because of beef production alone. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the amount of meat that we're producing globally and the demand and how much that's increasing year over year, what we're seeing is that that's going to, uh, basically you'd have to chop down every single tree on the planet by 2050 to meet that demand. It's, oh. it's increasing mm -hmm. so much. Oh my gosh. Wow. So, yeah. You could take all those farms that you're currently using for 
growing cattle and eliminate them and allow them to be rewilded. This is really transformative, Vincent. I mean, I, you and I have talked previously, of course, about this, but I mean, when I see the scale that you and other companies like yours, you know, are attempting, you're, you're basically, if and please correct me if I'm wrong, you're basically saying that we can, in a few short years, or maybe it'll be a few decades, I don't know, uh, completely replace the uh, conventional livestock system with a um, with this cultivated meat system, which takes up far less space, uses far less resources, and uh, doesn't involve uh, live animals anymore. Um, yeah, it's, it's I, I think we're looking at a few decades. Okay, but you're not talking about starting in a decade, right? I mean, you guys are starting like now or no, very this is soon. Happening. Yeah. You know, you look at companies like um, uh, Eat Just and Good Meat, who are actually selling real chicken in stores in Singapore right now. And, you know, they are the, the first market mover that's actually putting stuff forward. But there are so many in the pipeline to follow that, you know, this is not something that's, you know, where we're thinking about 10 years from now or 20. You know, this is happening right now today. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's super exciting. So, um I guess my question, my next question is, uh, well, I mean, why why are you going to to space to grow food right now, uh, as opposed to just uh, scaling up on on the plan? Or maybe you're doing both. But you want to tell us a little about that uh, angle? Well, uh, I, I think one of the the most important parts of space is the fact that humans are a part of it, and for so long we've seen as the 1960s have come and go and the heyday of, uh, you know, these, these crazy missions coming out um, and, and the world changing progress that, that brought with it um, kind of went to the wayside for a while. And so we're at this incredible inflection point where we have uh, amazing rockets on the horizon. We have amazing habitats that are coming out. And the only thing that's missing is how do we feed all these people and relying on uh, traditional rockets to supply all that, which while it's feasible to some extent, when we start looking long term, we start looking at thousands and hundreds of thousands of people uh, that simply doesn't scale. And so starting now to address how do we actually feed people is a uh, is a good starting point. OK. Well, um, and then I have to ask the dumb question, which is, well, why don't we just build farms in space and keep doing that traditional agriculture, but up there? I mean, does... I mean, you could. <laughs> uh, that, that sounds like a huge waste of, of volume and resources. Uh, but in its own right, it's a critical part of the puzzle. Um, so like this image right here is an interesting one. So back in the 1960s and 70s, there was this huge push for how do we, you know, like when we start thinking long term, um, you know, you're you're thinking about space architecture right in its head, right right at the very beginning of people thinking, you know, we have Saturn one, and you know, one of the early papers at that time was how do we make a reusable Saturn one or Saturn five and all these kind of things, and these were the kind of architectures they were thinking of, you know, having gigantic farms and i mean you even see like a little you know multiple tractors in that image and as you go <laughs> down, as you as you move outside of the rings you can start to see you know more and more animals taking shape and, and it was just an amazing premise uh at the time of, of how do we pull that off well i'm guessing the reason they drew animals in these rotating space habitats is because we didn't have the cultivated meat technology that we have now right so they couldn't you know, conceive of it. Is that fair? Or they just wanted to uh, to launch some some cows and pigs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just for the heck of it. Um, let's take a short break and then we'll continue with our questions. Ideas are powerful things. Ideas drive us to broaden our minds and help us seek truth about the universe around us. We are rogue space systems. Ideas above. So we have a listener question I'll, I'll throw in here. We're just talking about, you know, taking this technology into space and, and, and you know, cultivating meat off the planet. Uh, uh, one of our uh, regular listeners, Aiden, asks, 
uh, when this is being grown in space, is there the possibility or a concern of uh, deep space particles or radiation contaminating these space grown foods at all? So that's a good question. Um, I am not, I would not be worried about that at all. Um, so the, mm -hmm. so from what perspective, from like a biological perspective, this meat is grown in a completely sterile environment. There is no risk of any sort of bacterial salmonella E. coli. There's no chance that when you get this on your plate, that you're going to have uh, a recall uh, that comes, you know, a few weeks later, that just doesn't happen. Um, from the radiation perspective, uh, the base of the cells, the, how this process starts is we have a, just a handful of cells that we end up proliferating. Those systems, those, those pieces of cells can be put into radiative protective systems and boxes and chambers for those long-term hmm. missions so that you don't actually see any sort of cellular degradation over time. Um, so it's not too much of a concern. I'm bringing up an image here, Vincent, that uh, we were talking about just before the, the show um, that, that shows the structure of your artificially grown um, sort of meat at its, at its beginnings. Would you like to explain to viewers what, what we're seeing here? Sure. So this is what we call an actin dappy uh, image. And this is a fluorescent image when you take a look at scaffolding. And so inside this image, you can see those little tiny blue dots, and those are the nuclei of, of individual cells. And the red that you're seeing there, those are those cells that they're actually spreading out, they're forming fibers, they're starting to turn into real muscle tissue. Um, this image is taken mid-culture, so you can get, really get a sense for how these cells are starting to branch and, and get comfortable in their environment and, and what they're going to become. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so interesting. So, so at the end of the process, I guess you what what would what comes out of your box? Does it look like a steak or what's, what's the end product? Yeah. yeah. So there's there's an interesting part here where uh, there's two paths you can take with with our end product. So we can either go straight into a ground product, an unstructured product, which essentially says that. Um, the same mincemeat that you get at the store, it's basically the exact same format, ready to cook, ready to go. Hamburger patties out of it, that sort of thing, yeah. Grab your hands, shape it together, throw it on a grill, mm. have a good day. Uh, mm. On the other side of that, with some other processing that we go through, we can then basically extrude the different pieces, the meat, the fat, we put all those layers together, and that actually then comes out into a real piece of meat that has the correct marbling and shape and, and structure that you're used to. Gotcha. Okay. So really there's no limit to how realistic you can make these. There's more processing steps, but it's still feasible because you're growing it in the same way. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting here too, from, from the chef side of things, from, from the food perspective is you get into this interesting idea of because you're not bounded by traditional structure, uh, what can you create? So if you're a fan of Filet mignon wrapped in bacon or steak and bacon, or if you like uh, chicken fat and ham, I don't know. You can put those different combinations then together in the format that you're that you traditionally like. So, so you don't even have to go with something realistic here. You can kind of, you know, design these meats in a bespoke manner and and kind of take us even farther down. The, the yeah. imagination in a way, right? Yeah. And so the interesting thing here is this concept that I like to call uh, reusable bones. It's kind of a weird thing, but it's basically oh. this that you don't have to be limited by the traditional format anyways. If you want a ribeye steak in the format of a chicken wing, you can do that. You can take those two <laughs> really different concepts and, and put that together. You're not actually limited by the animal anymore. Yeah. Well, that's really I, fascinating. Yeah, this definitely sounds quite, uh, you know, creative. And I think the chefs will have a field day with it. I, I just have to ask the question. I mean, do you think the customers will go for it? Or do they think it's going to be weird to have like a, a chicken shape like a steak or a steak shape or whatever, you know? <laughs> I think there are, uh, I think there's a, a lot of customers that are, are interested. Um, we've done a lot of market research and we've shown that 
about 70% of people are interested in customizing the nutrition. So whether that means specifically saying that you have a, a ribeye steak with exactly, you know, 12% of fat, or you have a piece of fish that has an exact amount, you know, that's on one side of the spectrum. And there's also then other customers inside of that base. There's about uh, 40% that are interested in actually customizing the full experience, you know, taking mm. steak muscle with pork fat and, uh, and, and putting that onto a chicken wing or something like that. <laughs> so, so what about the nutritional profiles, right? Like, could, could we cultivate mm. a filet mignon that has omega-3 fatty acids that are usually found in fish? If, you know, my doctor recommends that or, or, you know, something like that, re be able to reduce the fat, change the you know, balance of proteins and different tissues? Well, what we can do is we can, we can grab a little bit from different things, right? So you might have a ribeye that has maybe a little bit of salmon fat to get those omega-3 acids, right? We can, we can take that. Um, I'm not sure how that would taste, uh, but sure. very feasible. Mm -hmm. Let so, the chefs experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah for ahead. sure. I think there will probably be a lot of experimentation. Uh, you mentioned that what you do is, is you take a, an initial small sample and essentially propagate that into, you know, eventually kilotons of, of cultivated meat. Mm -hmm. uh, but all from that one initial sample, where if I, you know, go to the store, I get meat from multiple different cows uh, or, you know, whatnot. Is, is there any concerns uh, or advantages around, you know, essentially having, you know, a, a single genetic stock, you know, producing, you know, such a, you know, massive amount of, of meat? Hmm. Well, there's, there's two things. So the one cool thing to, to talk about here is this concept of immortalized cells. Uh, mm -hmm. Didn't really know about it until I got into the industry, but Essentially, what happens is that there are stem cells within your body that can um, last and double essentially forever. And so when we talk about going and taking a sampling sample from a cow, what we're talking about is going and finding a breed that you like, whether or not it's, you know, from a specific region of the planet, getting those cells, immortalizing those cells, and then using that over and over again. So uh, I think you end up actually in this really cool symbiosis with traditional animal husbandry because you allow those farmers to really focus on improving the breed and mm. and really providing those animals with the best quality care that they, they possibly can and at the same time then as those breeds become healthier and more improved cultivated meat industry gets this great benefit of, of we now are seeing you know an improvement in our products yeah yeah so you know a decade down the road, you might replace your current stock with a, uh, with a brand new version as these cows have been bred over, you know, 10, 10 years to get even more, you know, delicious. Um, then you would get a new sample and start a new line then and, and be able to kind of pass on that, that, you know, benefits in breeding to, to the consumer. Yeah. And it wouldn't even be, you know, I would love for it to last 10 years. Uh, Mm -hmm. but you know at, at some sure, point sure, yeah 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 so sense. so you're kind of you know always also in addition to you know producing from a, a specific line you're all also always looking for you know new initial samples to to kind yes. of cultivate yeah. new lines and and improve your you know product offerings well and i think one of the coolest parts with this too is in terms of, of breeds, we actually really get into these, you know, e exotic non-standard breeds mm -hmm. for specific applications. Like um, what I think is interesting is when you think about uh, animal health, um, pets, mm -hmm. dogs, cats, and also the animals that we see in zoos, um, what we're able to do with that is actually provide them with the real nutrition that they would get when they were in their wild state. Yeah. And we can't do that today. You can't just go out and grab some gazelles and say, okay, lion, here you go. That doesn't really work, mm -hmm. but we're going to get to a point soon where we'll be able to provide them with an extraordinary level of care. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that application, but that's for, for basically for species preservation, conservation, I guess that's mm -hmm. the, the, the term that we're talking about here. Um, that could and be a huge advantage. Lions. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, so what kind of animal products can you grow? I mean, we've mentioned, you know, beef and pork and chicken and, you know, poultry. I think we talked about fish a little bit. What, what sort of, you know, meats, what's the range here that, that this cultivated mm -hmm. meat technology could, could handle? So for our technology, we're able to produce uh, fish and chicken and, and mammals and avian. And so basically, if it's something that's in the sea or uh, on land, uh, we're looking at doing it. Um, stuff like insects, Rain. not really touching mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, and also not really touching plants. But uh, there really is no limit um, on the, the mammal side of things. Yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. I guess that, yeah, that's that, incredible. Yeah. That opens the Go opportunity ahead. too for, for, you know, different meats of, of even, you know, species that are, you know, exotic, right? Not something you'd traditionally, you know, raise lions for food, but since this, this process of gathering that initial, you know, that initial sample is so, you know, uh, non harming to the animal, right? They, it's, it's yep. non-invasive, I guess, in a way. Um, There's actually a company, uh, Anji Meat, that is currently working on creating lion meat. Interesting, interesting. I'm I'm mm. curious enough to try everything once, so uh, <laughs> I will at least I will, will at least try when things like it, that come on the market. I mean, that actually makes me think that it could make it sort of much less socially controversial to try things that would normally be sort of. Can, you know, like nobody's going to go and say, I'm going to go buy a rhinoceros because I want to know how it tastes like because they're endangered, right? That would be a horrible yeah. thing to pursue. But this this would actually allow people to ethically do that. Well, and also when you, think about, um, when you think about culturally significant dishes or you think about incredibly harmful dishes, like when we're talking about like shark fin soup is a great example. That's an easy one where we could take those cells out of that shark and then produce that specific type of tissue. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, that's really fast. Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. The sky's really, well, not the limit, right? Cause we're talking about growing this in orbit as well, but it's a <laughs> right, really wide, right. yeah. Applicability. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess now is a good time to ask this question. So you spent some time in the space industry prior to yeah. starting this venture. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about that experience and how it's kind of, you know, informed your your thinking about uh, this this company and where it's going? Sure. So I, I started my career at United Launch Alliance working as a launch engineer working on the Delta IV rocket. Um, I worked on a lot of really incredible missions, my favorite being Parker Solar Probe. That's currently... Um, at least on its third dive around the sun, traveling at like 350,000 miles an hour. I mean, it's just ripping. Um, <laughs> it's also an incredible mission if you get a chance to, mm -hmm. to research that. They have some amazing data. Um, I worked there. I worked over at Blue Origin as uh, a lead manufacturing engineer on the New Glenn booster uh, assembly. I did that for a few years before going over to uh, to NASA to help work on the uh, launch equipment test facility for the SLA rocket. Okay. So how'd you get how'd you get from there into cultivated meat? You know, it seems like a pretty big leap, but I'm sure you've got some uh, story behind that. So uh, I during COVID uh, decided that after seeing like all the sustainability issues that were going on, I really wanted to to try to get into something that was sustainable driven. And I went on to uh, Y Combinator has a uh, co-founder matching platform and went on there to try to find someone else who was interested in the same thing. And that's how me and Ann Sophie got in contact. Oh, I see. Oh, cool. So you hadn't worked together previously, but Y Combinator made a match. Yep. All right. Yeah, it's a great function for it. Well. Um, so I think uh, I would like to now ask, well, it, Eric, did you have another question before we sort of no, I think talk it's about our joint? <laughs> All right. Yeah. So um, our two companies have recently announced uh, something, and I would like to hear from you uh, what that is and why you're excited about it. But uh, actually, I'm going to keep people in suspense for a couple of minutes because we're going to break here and do our our uh, weekly t-shirt drawing first. So if you can stand by for a minute, Vincent, I'll, I'll bring you back as soon as we're done with that. All right. 
So uh, as people know, uh, we're giving away a free uh, piece of merchandise, usually a t-shirt, but sometimes something else, depending on what we've got in the goodie bag, uh, to one listener who has signed up through, by becoming a YouTube subscriber. Uh, and there are uh, possibly some other ways of uh, uh, letting us know you're interested as well. Um, Eric, you did such a great uh, job with the sound effects the last time. Would you mind uh, giving us an artificial uh, roll? Gotcha. Oh, the dice I, I should have practiced. All right. <laughs> okay. Wow. Well, that wow. <laughs> it works. It's different every time. I love it. Uh -huh. I love it. Oh, there's a little hiccup there. Um, we have a winner for this week. Uh, the name is Anthony DeBond. Uh, Anthony DeBond, congratulations. You are the winner of this week's t-shirt drawing contest. So how does Anthony uh, get in touch with us so he can get his uh, his t-shirt? Yeah, just uh, send us an email, uh, ourfutureinspace at orbitalassembly.com and uh, give us your mailing coordinates and we can send you something from the goodie bag. And for everyone else who's who's watching or listening, uh, becoming a subscriber on YouTube is the best way to get on this list. So if you're listening on your podcast, um, just go to our YouTube channel. Uh, pretty easy to find. It's the Our Future in Space playlist on uh, the Orbital Assembly channel. And uh, hit the subscribe button, and uh, we'll get you on the list for the next week. All right. Well, thank you, and congratulations again. Uh, all right, Vincent. Well, uh, we've got you back. Um, would you care to uh, uh, give the audience a little uh, synopsis of what we've just um, uh, agreed to? Sure. So Micromeat is going to produce a system for producing about uh, one kilogram of meat uh, on board the Pioneer Space Station. Wow. That is so exciting. I'm just going to bring up a couple of articles that just uh, cover that announcement, which was just made earlier this week uh, between our companies. We're obviously super excited about it as well. And um, yeah, I mean, we believe in having the ability to grow our own food on station or to feed to the uh, both the crew as well as the, the guests who are on board and mm -hmm. looking forward. We'd like to be able to bring this really to scale. So uh, the first steps are to get a... Uh, companies such as yourself to be doing the first the first few um, steps and uh, it'll it'll be going forward from there yep. um, anything else you want to you want to say about the uh, the project or this point? well I think we're really we'll, we are really looking forward to it um, I think one of the biggest advantages to projects like this is traditional space architectures are inherently sustainable so having a, a partnership like this in place really helps micro meat with being able to build out a completely uh, efficient uh, functional system that, you know, while it's used in space, the benefits it's going to have on earth are tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. That should so we, really be emphasized. Yeah. Go ahead, Eric, please. Oh yeah. It's, it's, you know, it, I, I think this is really exciting. I mean, obviously, you know, here at our future in space, right. We talk a lot about, you know, this sort of long-term, you know, vision of, of, getting humanity off the planet and what that means and, you know, seeing, you know, steps like this to solve some, you know, some big problems in, in, you know, feeding humanity is, is really exciting. Yeah. We, we also love that by being able to do this at small scale in orbit with all the challenges that are inherent there and getting that to work, uh, that it will help you to be able to scale up to, the millions of tons that you eventually want to be able to grow on on the planet oh, yeah. and maybe one day in space as well well actually i think that's a great question like yeah. you know we've talked a lot about you know particular benefits on the planet right you know all this land that's being used to raise livestock you know could be you know really condensed into you know cultivated meat and, and you know the factories and the you know, associated things and that frees up a lot of just you know surface area um you know, and, and, you know, all the other benefits we've talked about as well. But but what about space? You know, wh why is cultivated meat really important for space exploration and, um, you know, space, you know, eventually expansion and settlement into into space? Sure. So the, the biggest part with trying to go to space is when you look at nutrient consumption of a single human. Um, it's a lot. You know, when you think about Earth and you think about the traditional uh, 2000 calorie a day guideline that exists out there. We take for granted just how much 2000 calories a day is, 
But when you think about that in space, that's a significant quantity of food. Um, that is traditionally sent up to the ISS aboard Dragon, aboard Cygnus, one of those um, platforms, and it's already pre-grown. But when you start thinking about missions that go out to, you know, even the moon or looking at Mars, looking at beyond Mars, you cannot take all of that food with you in a reasonable manner, right? You can, you can send up multiple missions, but from a cost effective position and a time position, it doesn't make sense. So there's two kinds of modes of thinking at the moment. There's either send it all up at once or, or go and become a, a vegetarian. And there's a few challenges I see there, which is first off, there's psychological effects of saying that you're gonna suddenly tell every person who wants to go to space, you now have to give up any part of your diet that relates to an animal product. Um, we've already seen that there's massive psychological effects from being aboard uh, you know, space analog missions, and those aren't even in space. So okay. providing mm -hmm. that next generation of explorers, that, that, that benefit is gonna be important. The other thing that's really nice with cultivated meat is the nutrient turnover time. So with plants, they're easy, right? You take a plant, you put it into your dirt, 30 to 90 days later, you have a plant, you have a vegetable that that's grown. The challenge with that mm -hmm. is the actual quantity of calories getting out of that is really inherently small versus that same time frame with a cultivated meat system you're getting a lot more nutrients. You're getting a lot more calories in that same time span. And that's going to last you a lot longer for sustaining your crew. I see. And and it, I'm assuming that it doesn't take a tremendous amount of space to do this either, right? I mean, it's not many times larger than the, the plant area that you would need to grow to grow a crop. So it's feasible to do on, on a space station, yeah? Yeah. And, and what's interesting here is that so meat is mostly water, right? When you think about the human body, it's 75, 80% water. And um, when we look at meat that way on board space stations and whatnot, that's a lot easier to think about carrying, you know, mm -hmm. rather than thinking about, I have to carry all of these different types of food products and all the plastic and all the, the, the you know, um, packaging that goes along with that. You don't need that anymore. Um, right. So yeah, it, it's basically it's, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. As we yeah. as we look into deep space, like let's say a Mars mission, right, where where we want to set up, you know, a permanently, uh, you know, inhabited outpost, uh, for example, or you know, eventually, you know, having people just you know live their lives there, um, you know, th there's still a, a a cycle here, right, that that needs to happen. Is is this a technology that you know, we could send an initial amount of raw materials out, you know, to a deep space mission and then be able to cycle through that and be able to continuously produce meat? Or is this something that's going to always sort of depend on a raw material supply chain from, from a place like Earth? So I think that's where we're getting into a really, really cool time with um, a bunch of merging technologies. Uh, so to, to, to start off with answering your question, I don't think so. I, I think at the end of the day, we'll be able to have closed loop ecosystems where Mars or the moon is existing on its own without inputs from the from yeah. Earth. Right. Um, mm. And one of the benefits of that is so like the majority of, of our system is actually plant based materials. There's really nothing that is unique there besides the growth factors themselves. And those are the proteins that the cells are using to to proliferate and then become muscle. Um, recapturing those growth factors is one of the hardest problems. And that is simply because it's incredibly difficult to grow those proteins. Um, that's where the emerging synthetic biology in industry right now is going to be a incredible advancement for, for humankind. I mean, we're talking about using biology to solve basically any problem that involves a material product. Uh, and that's going to be, I think, the key enabler to, to really get Mars and the moon to be independent is taking synthetic biology systems and then applying them for, uh, for retaking and, and taking that waste and then reapplying it. I see. 
Yeah, essentially, you're saying that if you can if you can uh, teach microbes or whatever your your vehicle, you know, your your biological vehicle is um, organism to to grow the things that you need, and we're learning much more very quickly how to teach it to, to, to grow just about anything, then they become the, the factories of the future. Yes. The first, yeah. the first pair of uh, cellulose grown shoes uh, was done about two weeks ago. With, wow. uh, with fungus, I think, and bacteria. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is incredible. Okay. Well, let's jump forward and ask what else might be possible in a few years. We're going to go speculative here. Okay. So it's fine. If, you know, this isn't like something you've necessarily uh, uh, checked out or vetted, but I, I'm, I'm curious sort of where you see this industry, both your industry and the adjacent industries of synthetic biology, you know, going, uh, what do you think that we're going to be able to do in, let's say a couple of decades time um, given current trajectories? In a couple of decades' time, I see uh, pretty massive changes. Uh, mm -hmm. I think so. One of the one of the things within synthetic biology is looking more at personalized medicine, and um, this is kind of a side thing of the microme technology is is opt is helping to optimize stem cell therapies and whatnot. But within synthetic biology, is trying to figure out how to provide the human body with the exact right thing it needs on a, on a personal basis. And so companies right now are investigating how to create proteins that solve specific niche diseases. So things like uh, albinism, where, you know, that is a specific protein in the body that's lacking. And there's companies that are working on that today. So looking out in the future, I see synthetic biology stepping into a position where you know, you might have a disease or something like that. You'll go get a tailored protein to you meant to help you either solve the disease entirely or slow it. And that is something that's edible. It's consumable. It's something that's tailored to you and it's natural. And you're just mm -hmm. taking those things on a day-to-day -day basis. Like it's nothing. But I, I think also the key thing with synthetic biology is that you start getting away from this concept of like mining and logging and just kind of damaging the planet. You know, we, we have everything we need in every corner of the planet at this point. And with biology and microbes and bacteria, we can transform everything that we have that's kind of being wasted and just being idle. And we can transform that into something that's usable again. And so you'll look a few decades out and you have a, Frankly, I'm, I'm optimistic about a, a much more sustainable, you know, yeah. path forward. I'm so encouraged to hear that. I, I mean, I, I, I hate to invoke it, but I think it's actually a really appropriate positive analogy here, which is to say, you know, we're most of us, probably all of us on this who are watching this are familiar with the Star Trek replicator idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, taking a couple steps back from how it's implemented or, or depicted on that program you're basically saying that you have these very small machines, engineered microorganisms that can take the raw materials in the environment and transform them into whatever it is that we need. Uh, right. Is that, I mean, that's kind of a, a version of what you're describing, I believe. Uh, well, that's what it sounds like to me. It looks like we might yeah. have a uh, lost to Vincent here. So. <laughs> All right. We're going to, whoops. Let's uh, remove him temporarily. Hopefully he'll be able to join us in a moment. Um, yeah, well, okay. Well, uh, hopefully, the, yeah, he's coming back in now. So hang on, Excellent. everybody. Excellent. Oh, that is, hey there. That is just some friendly uh, Florida recovery efforts. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, it looks like you still have power in the house, so that's good. For now. <laughs> no worries. Yes, for now. All right. Well, quickly, is there? I I don't know if you heard my question about the Star Trek replicator. If you would drop by then, yes. but okay. So, yes. are, are you essentially describing a a somewhat less fancy version of that? Um, well, I think that's actually the best description for the mm -hmm. technology as it stands. Um, I mean, you look at taking, uh, you know anything you have and transforming it into something else by using biology. And that is, I mean, 
as, as close to the replicator uh, mm -hmm. as you can get. Mm -hmm. And I think what's well, important here from my perspective is that what, what's, what's cool is that this is stuff that is being done, right? We're not, mm -hmm. we're not pontificating about this. This is occurring today. So you think about the rate of progress of, of computers. And so you look two de decades out and I mean, you can only imagine where we're going to be. Yeah. Yes. So, so let's, let's look two decades out for a little bit. What is your vision for the future in, you know, on earth and in space? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, we're, we're at this inflection point where we're going to be able to start seeing exponential benefits across the world, thanks to, you know, uh, kind of ex exponential acceleration of, of the growth in all industries, right? So uh, in the world of artificial intelligence right now, they're seeing incredible change thanks to Transformers. We're seeing an, a you know a quantum leap in space capabilities um, within the next decade. We're seeing synthetic biology coming out of the lab and entering real use. Um, you know we're we're kind of taking all of these ancient industries, uh, you know ancient meaning from a hundred years ago, and and we're rapidly <laughs> transforming them. And you know there there is actually like good signs of of real progress from the legislation. Um, that's starting to to push for these things to, to become a major player and, and effort. So, you know, when you look two decades out, I think you know uh, visions of of millions of people living and working in space. You know, you see that uh, definitely as a possibility. You know, maybe not a million, but you start to see that that thousand mark starting to be like yeah. that's definitely been hit. You know, and the question is, are we at five zeros? Are we at six zeros? You know, <laughs> where, where are we on that line? Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's just this, a wonderful merger that's happening at the same time. Yeah. Who would have known how important synthetic biology would be to sort of maturing the, this part of the space industry, at least the human. I mean, if we only send robots into space, well, we probably would still use it right for making, for mm -hmm. manufacturing various kinds of materials, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, they might not really need lion meat, but uh, yeah. <laughs> still, yeah. Yeah, still uses for sure. If it's in the bioreactor, it's all kind of the same stuff. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, do you, well, do you uh, see any possibility of using this in a, like a mechanical way, right? Like these muscles move, you know, move organisms around. Um, you know, we're, we've talked a lot about growing, you know, this meat in order to, you know, consume, right, for nutrients. But uh, is this technology, you know, possible to to use for robotics even to, to you know, use that muscle tissue to, to articulate joints uh, in that way or? In, in mm -hmm. 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, I won't say no to that. Um, <laughs> I think the cooler application, though, that we can definitely promise is applications like industrial materials. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll definitely see those all transition over uh this is kind of an interesting fact about like the paint and lubricant candle soap wax mm -hmm. uh rubber industries um they all use uh in some form like biofuels especially they use animal fats yeah. and uh all of those components can be switched over um but I, I do, though, see this kind of technology maybe not being used in robots, but I think that you will start to see as this tissue engineering uh, scope evolves and grows, you will start to see more application with human, you know, bodies and, and, and human implants. So potentially yeah. growing uh, organs or, you know, grafts or, you know, things like that. Hmm. Yeah, and especially like highly detailed um, there's been some amazing work in skin regeneration where uh, uh, patients' own cells are seated onto a scaffold and then put onto that area and their own body regenerates so deeply regenerates that even your hair follicles uh, are able to, to, to come back. Wow. Yeah, no, I can see the overlaps here, which is uh, obviously going to make this a very valuable and well-funded technology as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that 
really doesn't seem to have much limits. Uh, I was just going to mention, it was interesting that you were giving some examples of lubricants and I don't know if you said candles, some, some mm. things that were all based on animal fats, but I was thinking, well, a lot of those are also made uh, often from petroleum, which is another thing that we're trying to get off of, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing that you can't find on Mars. Yeah, yeah, and you don't have a whole lot of it on Mars, probably yeah. zero. Uh, but yeah, but either way, it's 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 another way to sort of uh, separate or, or, or sort of break the, the, um, dependency on these finite resources that we have on our planet and make us kind of independent of this much larger earth ecosystem that we're utterly, you know, utterly yeah, chained to right that. now. So, so Jeff, are, are you saying that we are going to move into the future by, uh, lubricating our steam powered spaceships with whale oil? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really hope I really hope someone does that. But yeah, I can imagine cultivated whale oil uh, used on, on we've talked about this, I think, on the show before, you know, steam powered, steam powered spaceships. So when, when people look to mining asteroids and bring water back, uh, one way to, to power that return trip is to just boil off the water and use steam. And so we could we could right. very much have a, a steampunk spaceship here in the future. I'm, I'm hoping for at least with the latest technology. <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, well, Vince, sorry. Did you have a comment about that? No, I, I think, um, I think the petroleum industry, especially biofuels, I think that's such an interesting application for this is, is actually providing a incredibly pure, uh, whale oil <laughs> for, for their use. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. So uh, we had another question uh, from a listener. They wanted to know what your opinion is on 3D printed organs. So I think your technology is at oh. least adjacent here. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that something that you think is is going to become in the forefront, or do you think that um, the sort of complete you know growth rather than kind of 3D printed is is you know what direction we'll move in? Uh, I think I think it depends on the application. I think 3D printed. Um, and, and I'm also going to put a modifier on here that, sure. uh, <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> my, this is a much better question for my, my co-founder, uh, for mm -hmm. Dr. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think the 3d printed comes into play when you're looking at specific tailored organs, um, mm -hmm. for an individual. So where I really see that being important is when you start looking at doing like 3d printed valves, 3d printed, um, kidneys mm -hmm. and organs and wow. more so where i think that kind of goes is you you create a base that is uh, a 3d printed kind of like structure where the entire organ can start to grow and then you transfer over into um mm -hmm. trying to to take you know a, a scaffolding like micro meat and, and providing it with the ability then to to actually have your body create out the rest of the structure. So, you know, 3D printed core and a, a entirety of the, the rest of the, the vessel. Um, gotcha. Yeah, and really then I have to ask the question, is that kind of organ growth, you know, printing a scaffolding and then uh, incorporating someone's cells, is that something which is uh, better done in a microgravity environment than on the surface of the planet? Yes. Uh, and I, I think what's really interesting with this is that when you know, when you when you're looking at um, pharmaceutical growth and protein structure growth, uh, it's really interesting that these, you know, at the scale that they're at uh, fluctuations in the microfluidic environment can spell for drastically different outcomes. So if you're looking for a repeatable, perfect process in space is great. I mean, there's, there's no chance of that gravity field coming in to try to induce that problematic fluidic event. You know, you can have perfect crystallization and, and perfect nominal cell growth. Um, I think the challenge comes into this open-ended question in the industry of how much does gravity play a role which is where the uh, Pioneer Station is such an uh, amazing application to be able to solve that. Right, because we have, I mean, just to repeat for our listeners, probably everyone knows this, but we will have the ability to, to spin or not spin and therefore provide both microgravity and partial gravity at whatever level 
you know, is required. Um, so we're really excited to learn when that will be applicable and when, when it's not needed as well. Yeah. yeah. So Vincent, what haven't we asked you that we should have? Uh, when, when the power will be back on in Florida. Yeah. I don't think the answer is one either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we've Fair covered enough. a lot. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. Well, I am really glad that you, uh, were able to join us and talk about the incredible work that your company is doing as well as, uh, you know, some of the, the, the stuff you're not directly pursuing, but that is going to be an important um, adjacent activity, mm -hmm. you know, over the next uh, few decades. You've, you've, I mean, gosh, I don't think I've gotten as excited about a uh, positive future based on one, one enabling technology uh, as this in a long time. So thank you. Yeah, we're, we're in for a, a very exciting 10 to 20 years. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think in a lot of different ways. So, oh, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, for everyone who listened, uh, you know, thank you for 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 listening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you want to be part of the conversation, uh, reach out to us on Twitter at Our Future Space or Facebook at Our Future in Space. And you can always just shoot us an email at uh, Our Future in Space at orbitalassembly.com. Um, you know, Please uh, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast or the YouTube, depending on how you're consuming this, uh, to make sure that you get updates when we have a new episode and uh, to join us uh, during the live recordings on YouTube. So thank you all for listening. And, and Vincent, thanks for coming. Thanks for and having sorry, me. Sorry, I just jumped. Yeah, you're welcome. Whoops. We got nobody on the screen that's who's talking. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. So thank it's, you for coming. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you for coming. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to say that if you're excited about the work that Orbital Assembly is doing and would like to uh, learn about ways that you can get more involved, feel free to shoot us an email at info at orbitalassembly.com. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Till next time. Bye-bye. This program represents the personal opinions of the hosts and their guests. The content, opinions, and views do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Orbital Assembly Corporation, nor the organizations with which any of the program participants may be affiliated. The mere appearance or promotion of this program does not constitute an endorsement by Orbital Assembly Corporation or its affiliates. Our Future in Space. Copyright 2022 Orbital Assembly Corporation. Hosts, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt. Record audio and video production by Tim Alatori. Musical theme, The Last Day by Dark Blue Studio.